people have a lot of resistance to contemplating the body as a topic of meditation. Some people complain they already have a negative body image. Why do we focus on the negative side of the body? Other people say that it's a way of fostering aversion to the body, which is an unhealthy mental state. Other people say, well, they're not all that attached to their bodies. Why do they have to focus on the body? Or people will refer to that story when the Buddha recommended contemplation of the body to some monks, and he went off into the forest for a couple of months. They got so disgusted with their bodies that some of them started committing suicide. Others hired assassins to kill them off. When the Buddha came out of the forest, the, the community of monks was a lot smaller than it had been when he went in. Some people cite this as proof that it's an unhealthy practice. The fact that people resist this meditation so, so much shows that it's an important topic of meditation, because it gets right, to the, gets right to the bone of our attachment. Now, there's nothing in the world that we're more attached to than our own bodies. And so people have all sorts of excuses for not focusing right here. And yet if you don't focus right here, what's going to happen? You're going to maintain your deep attachment to the body. It's not going to go away on its own. Some people think that they can short-circuit the process of attachment by going straight to their sense of self, thinking that by cutting out the sense of self they won't have to work on contemplation of the body, because it's deeper, more radical. But you can't get to that kind of contemplation until you've really looked at where your most blatant and day-to-day, moment-to-moment attachment is, which is right here to the body. The least little thing happens to your body, you can't stand it. A little bit of hunger, a little bit of thirst, too much heat, too much cold, sets you running off. A little bit of illness, you go running for medicine. If that's not attachment, what is? So it's important that we look right here, otherwise we get attached to this. And what happens to the body? As we all know, it grows old, gets sick, and then it dies. And if that's not going to be suffering, if you don't think it's going to be suffering, go spend some time with some very old people, some very sick people, with dying people. See how much they suffer. When I was back at my father's house a week or so ago, Every day I helped with the, the daily ritual of turning him over so you could take off his diaper. In the course of it, you got to see what an old body looks like, how an old body functions, and how much suffering there is involved, not only for the person in the old body, but for the people taking care of it. You also saw what it's like to be old and not to have trained the mind. The mind is totally out of control. Because as the body gets weaker, the, your energy falls, and thoughts that come barging into the mind ha can take total control if you haven't developed the, the ability to counter those thoughts. And then there are all the indignities of aging. It's like the human body is designed to undercut any sense of pride we want to have in ourselves. Other people have to wipe you. Other people have to turn you around. Whatever sense of privacy you used to have about your body, that gets thrown out the window. Can't control your urinating, can't control your defecating. Everything goes out of control. And it's good to contemplate this, not to get a sense of aversion, but get a sense of sangwega. Seeing how much effort goes into maintaining the body, and yet where all that effort ends up. If that's where you're looking for happiness, you're looking in the wrong place. That's what the whole contemplation is all about. And if you don't learn how to give up your attachment now while you're still healthy and strong, it's going to get harder and harder and harder as the body get weakens, as the body grows old. So it's important that we develop a sense of basada, a sense of confidence in the contemplation of the body. There's no way you're going to get over your attachment to the body until you look at it very, very carefully. The reason we're attached is because we don't look carefully. 
This is what the contemplation of 32 parts of the body is all about, contemplating the body in terms of the elements. All it is, what have you got here? Just physical elements. Do they belong to you? Well, no, they're all part of the world. As the phrase says, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We take in the elements as we eat, and we defecate the elements out as we're living, and then we have to give up the whole thing, and it all goes back into the elements when we die. So where are you going to look for happiness there? All that effort that goes into the body. And is the body true to you? Sometimes it does what you want, and other times it doesn't. And when it starts getting old and grows sick and dies, it doesn't ask your permission. You'd think that after all that effort you'd put into it, it would show some gratitude, but it, it can't. That's not its nature. We've been the ones who've been animating this. One of the images in the canon is of a, of a puppet. We pull the strings, but after all the strings break, the pieces break down. And it's good to get a sense of dispassion, disenchantment with the body. Develop that sense of sangwega. We chant the 32 parts of the body so often that the chant itself has become almost automatic. You can do it without even thinking about what you're saying. So stop and focus on each of the 32 parts. Stop visualizing each one as you go down. Start hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh. And as you visualize, you also have a sense of where exactly in your body is the part you're visualizing. When you get to the skin, you realize you've got the whole body. It's all surrounded right here. Flesh is all over the place. The bones right there in the core. Go through the various parts until you hit one that really strikes you. Reminding us, oh yeah, there's one of those in this body, too. And it really hits you how incongruous it is that you've been carrying this thing all around with you all the time. Anything that gives you a sense of how odd or disgusting or unclean or peculiar this body is, whatever hits you in any way that is helpful for contemplating. Here you are taking care of this so much, looking after it so much, and this is all you've got to show for all that effort. Again, we're not bad-mouthing the body, we're just looking at it for what it is. And ultimately, we want to learn how to use it simply as a tool without attachment, but in order to counteract the attachment, you've got to go in very far in the other direction to counteract all of the slick advertising slogans you've made about your body, about how important it is, how essential it is, all the good things that come from looking after it very carefully, doing all the yoga, eating all the right food. You can do those things, and yet still it's going to age, grow ill, and die. One of the meditation techniques that John Fuhrer used was when people developed a sense of light in their body. It was to have them visualize themselves. Sometimes they didn't even have to do it as an act of will. The, the, the image would appear right there in the light. It was just they could see themselves sitting right in front of themselves. You say, okay, think about five years from now. What is the body going to look like? Then ten years, fifteen, twenty, on up to when you die. What is it going to look like when you die? And then if you keep it around, second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, what will it look like then? Okay, after seven days, cremate it. Watch the cremation flames. And then what's left? Just some ashes and bones. And then the bones themselves will ultimately turn to ash. So you've got nothing but a powder right there. And then you'd have them run the film backwards, reassemble the whole thing till you get back to the present moment, to reconnect the fact that what you've got right here is headed that in that direction inevitably. The purpose of all this is that when there's the least little bit of delusion about the body, this contemplation cuts right through it any desire for an ideal body, any thought that, well, other people can get old, but I'm going to do yoga, I'm going to eat right, and I'm not going to get as old as fast as they do, it all becomes pretty futile. This is not to encourage you not to take care of the body, but simply to watch out for any delusion that gets built up around it. 
so that when aging, illness, and death come, you're more prepared. Another reason to contemplate that is, is to remind yourself aging, illness, and death are going to come. Do you, have you attained that state of mind that's going to be free from suffering when they come? If you haven't, how much time do you have? You don't know. So get to work right now. When the urge comes to cut short your meditation, remember this. How much more time will you have to meditate? Have you gotten to where you want to go? Because this is the this is the end of the storyline for all of us. Aging, illness, and death. This is where it's all headed. You've got to be prepared. Otherwise, you lie in bed hallucinating when you get old. Because the fact of your your being old, the fact of your approaching death is just too much for you to think about. The mind starts blocking things out. When it blocks things out in that way, then it, it heads towards delusion. It tries to run away as much as it can from the unpleasant things, and you can't run away. They're right there. So you have yourself trapped. The only way to get out of this trap is to dig down into the mind. That's where our hope lies. And the Buddha po points out that negative side of things. It's never just to stop with the negative side. It's to remind you. It's as a, a warning. This is the way things are. We like to think that life will have some nice point of closure when everything gets settled in a nice way, like the end of a piece of art or story or something. But it's not that way. Everything just falls apart. Things don't come back to the tonic key and resolve themselves nicely. There's this huge dissonance at the end of life. That's what the body has to do. That's the, the ending of the body. The question is, will the mind go that way as well? We have the choice. This is our opportunity to practice. So we contemplate this to develop that sense of Sangwega to encourage us to practice, to dig deeper. As the Buddha said, the contemplation of the body, mindfulness immersed in the body, ultimately leads to the deathless, if you do it right. If you do it wrong and develop a sense of real aversion, like those monks in the story of the Buddha. As the Buddha said, when you find that there are unskillful mental states arising from this kind of contemplation, go back to the breath. And that will help to dispel it in the same way that a, the first rain of the rainy season dispels all the dust and that's developed in the air during the hot season. But that doesn't mean you stop doing the contemplation of the body. It means you simply have to learn how to do it skillfully. So the sense of samvega is always there, and it impels the need for, for basada, finding confidence in something that will give us a release, provide the escape. So as the sutta says, we'll be happy even when ill, we'll happy even when aging, happy even when dying. But because our attachment to the body is so strong, we need strong medicine to counteract it. And it's not something you do once every now and then. It's something you have to do repeatedly. Keep coming back to this theme, because it's the only thing that will keep you sane, the only thing that will provide real release. So if you find yourself resisting this practice, look into that resistance to see exactly what it is. It's usually a disguise for. It's a disguise for your attachment. The body isn't the problem, the attachment is the problem. But to deal with that attachment, you've got to face it head on at the object where the attachment holds on very tight. So you can keep reminding yourself, this is what, the, this is what you're holding on to here. It's really not much. It's not worth much. And yet it, our attachment builds up so many narratives, so many desires around this body. So this is a topic of meditation that you have to have close at hand all the time, because these attachments come up in all kinds of ways. And you want to be ready for them. You want to be on top of them. So when the body, as the body continues doing its thing, where is down here, where is down there, this illness comes up, that illness comes up, you'll be prepared. 
In Thailand they have the tradition of printing books at funerals. And in the beginning of each book that's printed, there will always be a little biography of the person to whom the merit is dedicated. And a lot of the best Dharma books you get in Thailand are the ones printed at funerals. And so as you read Dharma books, you can't help but look at some of the biographies at the beginning. And they all have that same pattern. The person was doing well, had a happy life, wife, children, husband, children, whatever. And after a while they started developing a, a particular ailment, a little bit of kidney problem, maybe a liver problem, maybe a heart problem. And at first it didn't seem too serious. The medicine took care of it. But after a while it became more and more chronic, more and more of a problem. And not only to the point where doctors couldn't do anything, the doctors just had to throw up their hands. And it's funny, the human mind has a tendency to think, well, that's them. Somehow I'm different. Well, you're not different. Look at yourself. Look at all the people around you. You wonder, what disease will strike down this person? What disease will strike down that person? What disease do they have inside them already that's going to ultimately do that? It's all there. The potential is there. One of the contemplations I would do frequently in Bangkok is I'd be riding in a bus, and suddenly the thought would hit me. Everybody in the bus has a funeral ahead of them. There's going to be a funeral for this person, there's going to be a funeral for that person. You look at all of them. And it, it's funny, you might think it's pessimistic or sad, but it, it's a liberating thought. So you don't get tied up in the particulars of liking this person or not liking that person, or worried about this, worried about that. You know it's going to end in death. And that thought frees you to focus on things that are really important, like the whole issue of attachment. If you can see this practice as a liberating practice, because it is, but if you appreciate that fact, then you find you get more, more mileage out of it. So you have the right attitude towards the contemplation of the body. It can take you far. It can provide a lot of freedom, even in the midst of aging, illness, and death in the midst of all the indignities and pains and problems of aging, illness, and death. Because it helps point you in the right direction to the part of the mind that's free. The last time I saw John Sawat, he was mentioning that his brain was beginning to malfunction. He said it was giving him all sorts of weird perceptions. But he said, as for the, that thing I got through the meditation, he said, though, that hasn't changed. Which is why the suffering of the body didn't weigh on the mind. He showed that it's possible. And when something like that is possible, you really want to aim all your efforts in that direction. That's one, one of the chances. Don't be the sort of person who later has regrets that you didn't take advantage of the opportunity to practice. <laughs>